This is the Orion, a concept for an interplanetary or even interstellar spacecraft that's been around since before man set foot on the moon. Put in its simplest terms, the idea is to eject small thermonuclear bombs behind the vessel and then an acceleration plate that essentially absorbs the power of the explosion, driving the vessel forward. And believe it or not, this ship was capable of achieving up to 10% of the speed of light way back in the 1950s. Yes, you heard that right. Almost 70 years ago, we had the technological capability of traveling not only throughout the solar system at tremendous rates of speed, but also between stars within the space of a few decades. But of course, there were tremendous drawbacks to this as well. First of all, the subsequent signing of a treaty banning nuclear weapons was a huge negative, and of course such a thing would also generate a lot of radiation amongst other problems. So I've talked about a wide variety of alternative forms of propulsion on this channel, some of them more feasible than others, like nuclear thermal, which we're working on very hard right now, which essentially superheats hydrogen and drives it out the nozzle of the engine using nuclear power, and provides about two to three times the efficiency of a chemical rocket. Not bad, but not perfect and I've taken it all the way to antimatter transportation, which has the potential of bringing us all the way to 92% of the speed of light, although the requirements behind that are pretty daunting to say the least. But what if we could achieve something like the Orion without having to spend all of that money and explode all of those thermonuclear bombs? What if we could do something far more efficiently and yet still have the ability perhaps not to travel from star to star, but certainly about the solar system at very high rates of speed, making the human colonization of the solar system a much more realistic prospect? Well, this technology actually does exist, or the potential for it anyway, and the destinations, as you can see here, are out of this world. Get ready for a very special episode of The Angry Astronaut. Good evening and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So in a little over 24 hours from now or something along those lines, something big is going to be happening in the world, something that frankly I'd prefer not to think about right now. And when I don't want to think about events in the world that have me tense or however you want to put it, I like to think about things that have absolutely nothing to do with current events. And that includes alternate forms of propulsion when we're talking about exploring the solar system. Now, as you just saw, a concept called the Orion is an idea that we've had in place for over half a century. The idea of the rather blunt and uh, unsophisticated idea of exploding hydrogen bombs behind a spacecraft in order to provide thrust. Not huge hydrogen bombs, but certainly enough to provide a tremendous amount of thrust. Unfortunately, this is far from efficient. The bombs don't direct their force towards the spacecraft. The force goes everywhere. There's, of course, a whole lot of radiation involved and all kinds of other negative 
negative things. Still, the technology is sound and it's been around for a very, very long time. After all, we've had hydrogen bombs for an extremely long time in our history. And we could potentially make a ship like that right now. And we could even travel interstellar with something like that. But still, it would be immensely expensive. And it seems to me that given all of the advances that we've made in the past half century, we could do something better. Well, as a matter of fact, there actually is something better, substantially better. It operates on the same principle, but it provides a lot more thrust in a directed fashion. It is a lot safer. It's still something that we could do with current technology, and it could get us to Mars in about a month's time. A huge, huge improvement, obviously, over chemical rockets. And we don't have to wait for some big breakthrough with fusion or antimatter or anything like that. Even though it does use nuclear fusion to propel the ship, it doesn't require a fusion reactor. It requires the very same kind of fusion that we've been using in hydrogen bombs for a very long period of time. How can all of this been, be done? Well, I'm about to tell you about a study that was commissioned and carried out by NASA several years ago and exactly how this could be carried out. But it's called a fission fusion pulse, pulse rocket. And I'll say that again, a fission fusion pulse rocket. And I'm going to tell you all about it right now. This is one of a number of design concepts for something that I like to call Puff the Magic Rocket, or the Pulsed Fission Fusion Drive. Unlike the Orion, it uses a powerful electromagnetic field to produce tiny thermonuclear explosions and then directs the force or the charged particles from these explosions out an electromagnetic nozzle. Now the power for this electromagnetic field is provided by a system of stacked capacitors and these capacitors are recharged ingeniously by the explosions themselves. So once you get the first explosion going, the system becomes self-renewing, requiring no further energy to keep the engine going, just fuel. Now the fuel tanks, at least in this particular design, are stored in the truss or the backbone of the ship and they're comprised of both uranium-238, deuterium-tritium, and also lithium and I'll explain what all of those do here in just a moment. The design also includes a habitation module for the crew along with a lander for when they arrive at Mars, of course, and also a lithium hydride radiation shield a quarter of a meter thick at the back of the vessel. And of course, as you can see, the human habitation area is kept as far away from the nuclear reactions as possible. Any nuclear vessel also tends to generate quite a lot of heat, so this includes a number of radiators designed to dissipate this heat out into space. Okay, now I'm going to try to explain this in terms that people like you and me understand. First, lithium metal from these tanks is injected in a shell around a fuel target which is comprised of both uranium-235 and deuterium-tritium. A total of 2 million amps travels along the lithium core from these stacked capacitors creating a powerful electromagnetic field that compresses both the uranium and also the deuterium-tritium. Once the uranium is sufficiently compacted, it starts to experience fission, and then once fission starts to happen, it creates fusion as a result of the heat, just like happens with nuclear weapons. Let me try to explain this process a little bit more thoroughly. 
So the electromagnetic field compresses the U-235 until it reaches what is called critical mass, and the atom splits, creating energy and additional neutrons, which continues to split more unstable U-235 atoms, essentially creating fission, which if we remember our basic physics, we should know what this is. Once you have enough fission going and the heat that it generates, you can start fusing tritium and deuterium into helium and neutrons and this creates fusion and a lot more energy plus as you can see here an additional neutron from the reaction and here's the beauty of the system the energy generated by this reaction is actually absorbed by the lithium and used for another pulse and by the way, additional neutrons are generated by this as well, creating an energy cascade. More fission, more fusion, more fission, more fusion, etc. until you run out of fuel. And you provide a limited amount of fuel so you don't run into an uncontrolled chain reaction that destroys your ship. It creates a lot of plasma, a lot of directed charge particles, and therefore a hell of a lot of energy and a hell of a lot of thrust that is self-sustaining. So, quick review. The lithium shell produces a 2 million amp circuit, which in turn creates an electromagnetic field that compresses the U-238 until it hits critical mass. Once it does that, fission begins, and the heat generated from the fission generates fusion. The energy from this reaction is then absorbed by the lithium and recharges the capacitors for another pulse, and all of the charged particles that result from this kind of reaction are driven out the nozzle by the same electromagnetic field that compressed the fuel in the first place. So you get energy and you get thrust. How much thrust are we talking about here? Well, this might blow your mind. The specific impulse of a conventional chemical rocket is about 450 seconds. Nuclear thermal, as you're seeing depicted here, which is being worked on so hard at the moment, generates about 900 to 1000 seconds worth of ISP. By way of comparison, this form of propulsion will generate 20,000 seconds worth of thrust. And by the way, this isn't the tiny amount of thrust that's generated by ion engines. We're talking 29,400 newtons worth of thrust, or about 6,500 pounds worth of thrust. Not a tremendous amount if you're taking off from a planet, but a huge amount if you're already in orbit, which is where a ship like this would be constructed. And by the way, some of the designs I've been showing you are using different catalysts like antimatter and other things to produce a fusion pulse, but the principle is essentially the same. The difference is, is Puff uses both fuel and technology that we currently have in order to produce this kind of thrust, and the results are very impressive. So how would all of this work? Well, first of all, you would use a chemical rocket with a very heavy lift capability like the Starship to assemble the vessel in orbit. The Starship would also carry the crew module into orbit once the ship was ready for departure. A perfect crew module for this type of ship would be the Bigelow 330. Yes, once again, they are out of business, but still the technology exists. It has 330 cubic meters worth of space, one third that of the Starship. However, keep in mind, you're not having to travel nearly as long, so you don't have to carry as much supplies or anything else. 30 people could easily make the trip at a rate of 10 cubic meters per person. Once the passengers are safely on board, you engage your pulse drive. It takes six tenths of a day to escape Earth's gravitational influence completely, 2.6 days to achieve trans-Mars injection, 31.4 days worth of coasting, eight tenths of a day to decelerate into Mars, and 2.1 days to be captured by Mars's gravity. Total transit time, 37 days.
This, of course, means only 37 days worth of cosmic rays and interplanetary radiation. No suicide dive. Instead, you use conventional landers to put people down on the red planet. And they only have to adjust to one-third gravity after only 37 days in microgravity. A much easier prospect for future colonists. This is a way for us to transport large numbers of people to the red planet in a short amount of time, which is what Elon Musk has been trying to accomplish all along. In addition, a new type of technology called linear transformer drivers could reduce the weight of the capacitor banks and also give faster pulsing, allowing for even greater thrust than the current designs, increasing the efficiency by a factor of 10 if you can believe that. But that's currently what they're working on, and that makes the outer solar system accessible to this system as well. This would put the asteroid belt and also planets like Jupiter and its moons Callisto and Ganymede which are outside of its radioactive influence within our grasp. Also Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, all of these places which by the way are excellent sources of deuterium and tritium to go even further. As a matter of fact, the same report shows that this particular type of propulsion could allow us to pass up Voyager 1 within a space of five years. A vessel that we sent out in 1977, we could reach it and put it into a museum in five years time, presumably with an unmanned ship of course. Now obviously there are problems with this system, as there are with any new generation propulsion system. Transporting highly radioactive substances like U-235 off of Earth's surface using conventional rockets could be very hazardous to say the least. Launching it from areas where we've already conducted nuclear tests would probably be a pretty good idea. And then in addition to that, you've also got test bans against nuclear weapons in outer space, which would restrict the use of such drives, although it's the most constructive use of nuclear weapons that I could possibly think of, along with other drawbacks. Nevertheless, the very thought of being able to go to a place like this using current technology and not with robots but with human beings is exciting enough for us to find our way around these problems and do it, at least in my opinion. What do you think? So I hope this episode has demonstrated to you that with current technology, we can reach Mars in, in time frames that are orders of magnitudes better than we can currently with chemical rockets. Just a huge, huge difference. And there are so many advantages to this, as I pointed out in the video. Not for cargo. We can use chemical rockets and things like the Starship for that for a very long period of time because... When you're talking about delivering cargo to a distant destination in the solar system, time doesn't matter as much as long as you plan the logistics and the operation far enough ahead of time. That having been said, human beings are an entirely different matter. Human beings don't do well in interstellar space. Cosmic rays, radiation, microgravity, all of these things can take a tremendous toll on the human body. So if we want to go to Mars and to other destinations throughout the solar system, the more that we can reduce the travel time, the better. And this form of propulsion, a pulsed nuclear propulsion that can use the technology that we have available now, should be something that we are pursuing at the moment. Nuclear thermal is certainly a good alternative, but this, in my opinion, is even better. And we should be investing money in it, not tens of billions of dollars in the SLS. Granted, we do need to get to the moon and we do need to proceed with Artemis, 
but we also need to be thinking about Mars and more effective ways of getting there and getting large numbers of human beings there as well. And if we can reduce the travel time from six months to one month, it's going to make a tremendous difference. And we should be pursuing that as aggressively as we possibly can. I mean, look at the billions of dollars that we've invested in nuclear fusion when it comes to killing each other. And if we could use the very same technology to propel us to Mars within a month, why have we not done it yet? Because we've been able to for a very long period of time. It boggles the mind and it absolutely needs to stop. So I hope all of you have enjoyed this. And if you want to continue seeing content like this, there are, of course, obvious ways to do it all in the description. I certainly could use more Patreon supporters all the time. I certainly want to go to some other destinations throughout the country to bring you more details about America's advances, and not just America, but perhaps other countries as well, as private companies begin to take over from national organizations in terms of exploring the solar system and exploiting this universe around us and colonizing it as well. And if you are unable to support me in some financial way, I totally understand. As I've said many times, it's not your responsibility to pay my bills, but please subscribe, please like, and help me blow up this Boeing cup. I've only got eh, about a little over 11,000 subscribers to go as I'm recording this. We can make it. I'd love to make it by the end of the year. So let's keep going. So until we are ready to really put a good foot forward and make every advance that we possibly can when it comes to transporting not just cargo, not just probes, but human beings to other planets throughout the solar system, and not just to go there, but also to go there to stay, to colonize them, to make the human species an interplanetary race. I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>